there's a drum setup detail I was wrong about. And it's something I've been talking about for years and getting YouTube comments about. And I vehemently defended my setup. But recently, I interviewed an expert on drum and body mechanics, and it turns out I was wrong, or at least partially wrong. And the details are important, because getting your drum setup right can be the difference between playing comfortably into your 70s and ending up a broken, crumpled, hollowed out husk of the person you were. Just nobody wants that. Let's back up just a little. Starting a couple years ago, I've been on a quest to improve my drum setup to make it more ergonomic. In doing that, I've been asking questions like, what's the best height for the throne? And what's the best height for the cymbals? And even, at what angle should you face the drums to avoid a twist in your back? And we'll address all of that in this video. But throughout the years, there's been one thing I've disagreed with plenty of people in the comments on, and that's rack tom angle. The thing from the thumbnail. I've even called excessively angled rack toms silly. In this past week, knowing I was going to be interviewing Brandon Green from the cleverly named Drum Mechanics channel, I recorded some video of me playing on a little four piece. And Brandon actually made me a video breaking down my setup and movement. Is right now you're making the motions very shoulder centric. And yes, it turns out I was wrong, or at least partially wrong, about my hobby horse, rack tom angle. Okay, but what is the best angle for the rack tom? And how do you figure it out for you? We'll get into that and into why. But we won't stop there. I'm going to summarize everything we've learned about drum setup and drum ergonomics into kind of a definitive guide. So you can rest assured you're not doing anything that will hurt your body long term. And disclaimer, I'm not a medical professional. You should not take this as gospel. Please check with your <laughs> Today on 8020, drum mechanics expert tells me why I'm wrong on rack ton angle and more. Stay tuned. <laughs> And guys, if you're enjoying this interview, you might be tempted to take notes. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to do that. If you want to download a free study guide we've prepared for you, you can just click the link below the player and tell us where to send it. You'll also get my full interview with Brandon Green, the drum mechanics expert, a few days before I release it to the general public, and every subsequent podcast episode early. Who doesn't want that? That's all yours when you click the link below the player. On to the rest of the video. Here's an excerpt from a video I made about four years ago. But if a beginner has practiced and performed right before me, much less on a big kit, much less on a five piece, which by virtue of that middle tom needs more clearance, it's 10 to one, I'll find the throne super low and the rack toms inclined severely. I was young and more of a snob, and I thought I'd noticed a pattern where every time a less experienced drummer played the same kit, I'd always find this, the rack toms angled severely down. When I learned to set up the drums, I learned a different way. When the snare drum's placed at an appropriate height, there's a much smaller distance to cover between the snare drum and the high rack tom. But as it turns out, it's not one or the other. There's a key principle of drum movement that underlies at what angle you should put your rack tom. And over the years, I'd get comments on my videos hinting at it, like this one. Rack time angle was just one of the growing number of ergonomics questions I had, so I decided to reach out to an expert. Somebody who specializes in exactly this. And where does one search for an expert at the nexus of physical training and body movement best practices and drums? This guy. For every semester I took off the first class, so I could, didn't start school till 10, but so my mom would leave and I could practice from 7 a.m. till t uh, 9 o'clock every morning and then go to school. I was like really committed to do the whole thing. So at 24, I started teaching biomechanics and exercise science to trainers all over the world across Canada. Brandon runs the very popular Drum Mechanics channel on YouTube and Instagram. And he's done breakdowns of the setup and body mechanics of a lot of popular drummers. So glutton for punishment that I am, after Brandon agreed to speak with me, I sent him a clip of a recent video and asked him to roast me like he did those other drummers. And guess what he picked up? Nate, when you messaged me, you said people have been picking on your rack tom position. So I'm gonna throw two things out there. One, the angle of your rack tom here actually looks pretty good. However, the proof is in the pudding when you start to perform on it. One of the things you observe if you actually go up to the rack tom, you see you actually have to reach up to it to bring your arms down. So you're actually reaching over the limb, the rim of the rack tom, and that actually creates more work for you. And this gentleman that you've got right here, he's actually a perfect example of his angle is just a little bit more. Coming back to the original point, his shoulders are not elevating whatsoever. This is actually a fantastic clip, but you can see that he's only reaching forward to hit the rack tom rather than having to reach over the rack tom rim. Rack tom angle. And the fact that Dana Hawkins, one of my favorite drummers and podcast guest on the 8020 Drummer podcast, was using a more optimal setup than I was, and it was helping his already amazing movement, helped to drive it home even more. So this past week, I went back to the shed, 
armed with Brandon's advice and tried to figure out how to modify my setup. And the guiding principle was this. You actually just move your hands forward rather than forward and up to hit that rack tom. You shouldn't have to lift your hands. So I made a little change. I angled my tom a little more. And so far it feels good, but does that mean sky's the limit and you can have your toms nearly vertical? In other words, was I 100% wrong back in 20 whatever? Much less on a big kit, much less on a five piece, which by virtue of that middle tom needs more clearance. It's 10 to one, I'll find the throne super low and the rack times inclined severely. No, and I'll explain why in just a bit. But first, let's get some of Brandon's other answers about optimal kit setup. And I kind of want to go through a few of these, these things slightly rapid fire. Jump setup principle number one. Is there one optimal jump setup or does literally anything go? How closely do those converge onto one optimal setup and how much fudge factor is there and how much room is there for, for personal taste and, and other things. There's plenty of room for personal taste. And actually I just recorded a video and I realized that I was copying your brand name. So I'll have to trade reverse trademark. But I think that there's this 80, 20 window as far as how you can set things up. So ultimately forgetting if it's a four piece or a five piece, we have a window of opportunity of how far we can set things based off of our geometry. Like I like, in my opinion, to try and set everything up so that way if I externally rotate my arms, right, I get my arms out to about a 90 degrees of external rotation, things are tight here. I could put instruments here, but it's tight. I don't like that, right? That's like, that's the end of my car door range. So if I come into about 45 degrees or 50 degrees, I don't feel any tension here. So to me, anything that is within this window where I don't have to reach out too far is really fair game. Let's go to the kit. When I think about Brandon's advice, we're talking about the limits of external rotation of my arms on the left right axis and pulling my elbows from the body on the front back one. If I'm gonna be playing anything frequently, I want it within the range where I can comfortably rotate my elbows and inside the range where I can reach it without extending my elbows away from my body. But what about drum and cymbal height? Can you think of any overarching reasons why or just principles wise, what to think about and when thinking about height of toms versus cymbals and so forth. When stuff's really low, it's going to pull you low. When stuff's really high, it's going to pull you up. Now, there's a point of diminishing return for all of these. Like there's a continuum of like, this is a good range and you get high. Like I think Forrest, honestly, I gave him a shout out a long time ago because he's got high cymbals. But he's got high cymbals kind of like in the Dennis Chambers kind of way. Like everything's kind of close to his body. So he's not like, he's not reaching to hit stuff over here. Like he's, like, he's all like within reach. So that's cool. Drum setup principle number two. Use instrument height to encourage good posture without having to reach. When I'm trying to determine how high to set up things in general, as long as I don't have to reach principle one, having things like drums relatively higher will encourage a tall guy like me to sit up more. It's the same with cymbals. As long as I don't have to extend out at the elbow, having the cymbals relatively higher just encourages me to sit up straighter. Which brings us to one of the fundamental issues. Oh, Nate, even in the intro, I want you to observe this. In your chopping out clips and in the intro video, you've got your head down. You consistently are looking down towards the instrument, which does put a lot more stress against the backside of your neck. There are two reasons why this is gonna negatively influence you. One, neck posture when you're collapsed down increases something called torque to the back of the neck, so all the muscles have to work harder. So ultimately, if you're susceptible to neck tension, fatigue, discomfort in any way, this is gonna only exacerbate that because everything is in a position where it has to work harder to hold your head in this position rather than being up tall. I'm a slumper. Been that way since way back. And over the years, it's been getting better little by little. I've been using setup as we spoke about, but Brandon had still noticed a little slump. So just militantly sit up straight, right? Pull my head back, muscle my spine into extreme extension, but something wasn't sitting quite right with me, pun intended. It was this clip from Mike Isratel, one of the most qualified and least BS fitness personalities online. Folks, posture is the single biggest cesspool of bullshit ever. Posture is mostly genetic. It has almost nothing to do with muscle strength. It's just how you usually sit. If you want better posture, check this out. Just be attentive of it, sit more upright, and over several weeks, you'll learn to, by default, sit more upright. There's no exercise you need to do in the gym. Nobody has bad posture because their pecs are too strong and their back is too weak. I shared his critique with Brandon, and here's what he said. Do you know, have you ever seen the image when you go into a chiropractic office to see it online and it shows like six different examples of posture, right? There's like a rounded one and a neutral one and then a straight one. We've seen that before. It's kind of like a common 
posture picture. There's kind of a baseline one that you go to most medical offices and it's like, this is good posture, this is bad posture, like, this is kyphotic, this is lordotic. That picture originally, the original picture that had like the five variances in spine positions was actually showing the five different, like a handful of different common postures that people just had, right? This was like 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago. It might've been Da Vinci era, right? They were just showing like, this is how someone's spine could look like this or like this or like this. And then somewhere along the way, without getting too deep, someone went, this is the right one because everything's on top of one another and these ones are less good. And so that opened a whole can of worms because now we have entire modalities that look specifically at going, we need it to be straight. From a classical mechanics perspective, when we talk about torque, rotational inertia around an axial environment, there are some things that they say that are true, right? If I'm leaning forward, there is more, ex more challenge on the, my muscles in the back. If I sit forward long enough, Wolf's Law, my bone's going to change shape over time and it's going to hang out there. Ultimately, the word posture is not good or bad. It literally just refers to a position. That feels like real reasonable evidence-based advice. So instead of revamping my entire routine, I'm just gonna pay a little more attention. Record myself from the side and notice when I'm slumping. Think about looking up instead of down at the drum kit. And gradually over time, try to train myself to sense when I'm crumpled over so I can correct quickly, but not overcorrect. I've probably got genetic Ichabod Crane posture, so my real mission is not to make it any worse when I'm playing. And these tips from Brandon are just scratching the very surface of the over hour long interview we did, which is going live on the channel next Tuesday. If you're watching this before then and want to get that complete interview for free, just click the link below the player and tell us where to send it. And you'll also get a free drum course I don't share on YouTube. And the show notes for this episode. But what about the Tom angle thing? Like having to bend your wrist at a pretty severe angle to get the correct angle for striking the tom with the stick. I said earlier I wasn't completely wrong. And here's why. Yes, you're optimizing so you don't have to lift your arms and hold your elbows away from your body for extended periods of time. Principle one. You want your drums high enough that they encourage you to sit up, depending on your body and comfort level. Principle two. And together, these encourage a rack tom that's reasonably high, but also angled toward you slightly. But there's another constraint. Stick attack angle. You still want your toms flat enough that your stick isn't meeting them at an extreme angle, as in this video. Or an angle that negates the benefits of the tilt because you have to hold your elbows out to get the ideal angle. So you want your rack tom angled toward you just enough that you don't have to lift your hands or pull your elbows away from your body, but not so steeply you're going to be hitting them at an extreme angle. That's how you get the gig. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this one. And as I said, there are a lot more tips in the full-length Brandon Green interview. If you're watching this before February 27th, 2024, you can get that complete interview for free by clicking the link below the player. If you're watching this after, you can still get the show notes free and a free drum course for me, which will negate the need to take notes. Dudes, it's been real. Always enjoy these. See you again real soon in another lesson of the week.